In France, they are mourning the worst peacetime attack since World War II. It is the deadliest outburst of terror in Europe since the Madrid bombings a decade ago. More than 120 people killed and over 350 injured in just a few hours of carnage. Multiple acts of barbarity which have rocked Paris. This was the first indication that a night of terror had begun. Ten minutes later, a second explosion. Outside, there'd been two suicide bombings at separate gates of the Stade de France. The game carried on all the way to the nine minutes. As, as far as we were aware, it was... I mean, even though we were getting news reports, we thought it was something trivial. We thought it was a hoax or a, something that had gone wrong. We didn't realise the full extent of it until we got outside. The match continued. It was only after full time and a third explosion outside that people started to leave the France and Germany friendly. The three suicide bombers had failed to deliver the mass casualties amongst fans they'd hoped for. One man, caught by flying shrapnel, told how his mobile phone had saved his life. I was crossing the road and there was an explosion. Everything went up in flames. I felt the reverberations. I fell down. Here's the phone that took the impact and it saved me. Some spectators flooded onto the open space of the pitch amidst the spectre of an increasingly terrifying night, seemingly the only safe place they were prepared to go. The famous faces of the two sides watched TV monitors, scarcely able to believe what was happening. The German team were advised to stay at the stadium overnight, fearful of travelling to their hotel. Shortly afterwards, Francois Hollande was driven away to a secure location. By now, it was clear something very serious was unfolding and Paris was in the grip of multiple coordinated attacks. Five miles away, the Bataclan Theatre was packed with young music fans. We were by the bar, so we heard firecrackers, or what we thought were firecrackers. We turned around and then I saw two young men, no older than 25, with Kalashnikovs. They told us to lie down. There was one who kept gesturing for us to get down. We all lay down. The whole room lay down. I was completely under other people, and they kept shooting, but they would stop from time to time. The concert had started about half an hour before. We heard firecracker noises and we turned around and saw two young people. Two young people, well, we were a bit far away, so two people with machine guns firing into the crowd. So we all laid on the ground. There was panic, screams, shots continued to be fired. At the right of the stage, a door was opened and we all rushed there. We got stuck there. It was leading to a staircase. We got stuck into a staircase for five to ten minutes. People were trying to force some doors open, but the doors only led to dressing rooms and green rooms. Elite police units take up their positions outside the hall. Inside, the attackers were yelling, this is for Syria, it's the fault of your president. With the 1500 seat venue a sellout, the horror of a hostage situation was starting to take hold. This footage shows the back of the theater and the desperate efforts of some to flee trying to climb from first and second floor windows. This injured man got out through a back door. S'il vous plaît, qu'est-ce qui se passe? Ah? What's happening? shouts someone. Others also make it to safety. 
Dozens more would not be so lucky. As it became clear the terrorists had started killing hostages, elite police units tried to move in. They were repeatedly pushed back by the gunmen. One woman who managed to escape is seen being rushed away, her life safe. For several hours, the sound of gunfire could be heard until this. One after the other, two of the attackers blew themselves up with suicide belts. A third was killed by security forces. Finally, the survivors were able to walk free. At this one venue alone, more than 80 people lost their lives. At such a large concert hall, the gunmen secured their ambition for mass casualties. This was by far the highest number of people killed in a single location on a night of coordinated attacks. The worst is I saw the people coming out of the Bataclan, injured, shocked, because many people was, uh, um, get, get, went out of the, of the place, and that's what I experienced in the street. That was the hardest, because I, I met a lot of people shocked, blood, bloody, injured, and when I heard about the first news that it was only 10, 15 people killed, I told everybody, you don't even realize what's happening inside because I heard about the people going out. And they told me it's a slaughter inside. They're, they're shooting everybody inside. I knew it from the beginning because I was very close. The Bataclan had been full of mostly young people. By a twist of fate, one woman told us how she escaped the siege just as it was beginning. 10 seconds before the shooting, I was just next to the Bataclan, just like two steps, and they start shooting. So I was like, OK, thanks, God. I'm not in the Bataclan, but I just remember the people. So I saw the people just sitting in Bataclan, just laughing and drinking. And I was like, oh, Mom, look, haha, she's cute, OK. And now they're probably dead, actually. So It wasn't just high-profile venues which came under attack. Neighborhood bars and restaurants were also targeted. Famed for its cafe culture, many Parisians were sitting ducks. This footage gives you a sense of what the people of Paris went through on Friday night, having to tend to the injured on pavements. The third team of gunmen randomly roamed the city, shooting in numerous locations. In one restaurant alone, 19 people were killed. At another, a gunman used an automatic weapon to shoot through windows. I heard some noise when I was at the bistro, which is where I work. I got out, I started running. I was looking for where the sound was coming from. I figured out it was coming from Le Carillon and Le Petit Cambodge. I arrived at the scene and there were lots of dead bodies on the ground. Lots of dead bodies. Lots of dead bodies. When Parisians woke up to the reality of their Friday night of terror, there was a sense of disbelief. One man told how he should have been watching football in the carry-on bar. Instead, he saw the shootings unfold from his daughter's apartment. I saw all these men running in all the direction. People just in front here, under the table, and the people shoot them down. And it's horrible. It's like war. What crazy. These people must not win.
They make so many problems all over the world. We must be together. <laughs> they kill our child. <laughs> Innocent people. 18, 20 down set here. It's awful. During three hours of terror in a series of coordinated attacks, three groups of gunmen ran amok across Paris. <laughs> Amongst the huge crowd at the Bataclan Theatre were two friends from Scotland. Arriving back at Edinburgh Airport, they told Sky News how they feared they might die. We were just at the concert. We arrived just after eight. Um got down to the front, met up with some friends um, we hadn't seen for years. We were enjoying the concert and then heard what we thought were like, well, I thought were firecrackers behind us because we were right at the front. And I turned around and when I saw them. I seen the bullets hitting the stage and just instantly knew that it was gunfire and we needed to get out of there. Just sort of one round, very quick succession. It stopped, people gasped, thinking that it was part of the show. Um, and then a second round went off and most people ducked, just their instinct was to duck. duck and I just said, run, just get out of here. Um, they were close to an exit, so we just ran. Um, in the confusion, if we had gone left, we would have instantly been out onto the street and probably the first people out of the building. Um, just confused, we ran right ended up being in a room that we couldn't get out of, there were no exits, um, but we found the door to the cellar, um, which we just ran into, but then realised we were, we were trapped, there, there was no way out of there. Um, a few seconds later, the door burst open, and we just thought, they're coming, you know, we've got to die. Um, it was two other concert goers, um, which we managed to lock the door and just barricade ourselves in, turn the lights out, and we were then trapped there for the next three hours, just... Others were not so lucky. These are just some of the faces of those killed, mainly young and from all over the world. Nohemi Gonzalez was a 23-year-old design student from Los Angeles. She's the first American confirmed to have been killed in the attacks. Valentin Ribe was the first victim to be named. The 26-year-old French lawyer graduated from the London School of Economics he was described by colleagues as a wonderful personality. Asta Diakite was the cousin of the French international footballer Lasana Diara. On Twitter, he said she was a big sister to him. Nick Alexander was from Colchester in Essex. He was killed at the Bataclan Theatre, where he was selling merchandise for the band who were performing. His girlfriend tweeted, You are, and always will be, the love of my life. What I heard is that he died saving the life of, of another human being. And that's, I think, the act that all of us wonder if we'd be brave enough to do. It's tragic, but it's also awe-inspiring. And, and, you know, I don't think anyone knows if they'd be strong enough to do that um, until it happens. Parisians want to know who was responsible for the mass casualties of Friday night. And links have already been made to neighbouring Belgium. This is a poor suburb of Brussels. The man being arrested is one of three taken in a raid believed to be linked to the attack. Investigators are slowly piecing together a picture of the eight men who caused murderous chaos. Police believe they found a Syrian passport next to the body of one of the Stade de France attackers. He's been named in the passport as Ahmed al Mohammed. Police say he passed into Serbia last month as part of the wave of migrants entering Europe via Greece. Another attacker has been named by a French member of parliament as Ismail Omar Mustafa. He was identified by fingerprints taken from the Bataclan Theatre where he blew himself up. He was a 29-year-old French citizen with a criminal record. Mustafa had been flagged as a radical Islamist but never linked to terrorism before. A French judicial official says Mustafa's father and other family members are being questioned. 
An Egyptian passport was also found near the remains of another suspected attacker. Until a couple of years ago, Ismail Mustafa lived in this neighborhood just outside Paris. France is coming to terms with the fact that at least one of its own citizens was involved in the attacks. I knew him by sight. My sister-in-law, who lives near his house, was taking care of my children. I brought my children here and I saw him dozens of times. And there were no problems. Homegrown terrorists have struck before. Police will be trying to find out if there are links to the three days of terror that shook Paris in January. The city is still hurting from the multiple attacks which left 17 people dead. Twelve of them were shot at the offices of the satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. There were hostages then as well at a kosher supermarket in the east of the city. Some believe Paris got back to its casual way of life too easily. Others say people have been let down by the government. They failed to anticipate this attack and will have to understand why this happened and correct whatever went wrong and what went wrong went wrong big time. At the second item is a very difficult one and that is the level of sophistication and expertise of this attack is really rather scary because they combined uh, shooting, suicide attacks, uh, mass hostage taking, a mixture of Bombay and Moscow, if I can, if I can put it that way. Uh, this, I think, people were not really expecting here. On the defensive, France's president says his country is now at war with Islamic State. The group has claimed responsibility for the attacks, blaming France for bombing IS in Syria. It was a deliberate, organised and planned act of war. We are working to establish all the facts. It's an absolutely barbaric act. There's been international support for the people of Paris, a real sense of global revulsion that such brutality could visit ordinary citizens simply enjoying a night out in such a beautiful city. My message to the French people is simple. Nous sommes solidaires avec vous. Nous sommes tous ensemble. We stand with you, united. Over the weekend, the floral tributes outside Le Carillon Bar have grown and grown, covering the pavement where two nights ago people lay shot and injured. <laughs> Why? asks this woman. They can understand an attack on a high-profile landmark like a football stadium. But this was just a local neighbourhood bar. Do you know with the Charlie Hebdo uh, shooting, it, they were like targeting some people precisely, like journalists of course. So you feel the danger but you don't feel too endangered. Now it's like they are watching you, me, everybody. It's, it's really strange to think about that. With my my cafe, with the dead bodies around, and you feel like, oh la la, Paris is really in a strange situation now. A state of emergency has been announced across France, and 1,500 military personnel drafted into the French capital. With fears that some of the gunmen may still be on the run, Paris is in lockdown. Parisians have been told not to gather in large crowds, but they couldn't stay away from the city's famous Place de la République to write messages of defiance against those who want to break their spirit. Even though it's forbidden to be together in a public place, they're here, so I think that's great. I don't know, we just feel very sad and it's terrible. And, um, but you know what, we are French and we're going to stand up and fight for our rights. We are proud of our liberty, of our freedom, and of our equality for everyone. I was very upset, of course. I mean, who could not be upset? It's just impossible. Sorry. On Friday night, football fans leaving the Stade de France sang the national anthem, Le Marseilleuse. 
digging deep to show the solidarity needed to get through a weekend Parisians will never forget. Oh!